Soaring home prices, whether for houses or condos, have left little room for people to follow that sage old advice to buy low and sell high. What should they do instead? Well, with us to offer some sage modern advice, Shannon Lee Simmons, financial planner and founder of the new School of Finance. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. We're going to give you three scenarios here because particularly in the capital city here, real estate prices are insane. Absolutely. So let's go through this and we'll get your advice. Uh, scenario one, person with some savings, wants to live in the city, mm -hmm. can afford a condo, not a house, eventually wants to move into a house, potentially with room for kids. At this stage of their life, how should they be investing their money? Okay, so you can look at this two ways. If they're into owning real estate, um, a new clever way that people are doing it is that they're actually investing in real estate outside of the cities where they can still afford it and then having it rented out. So they're kind of like putting their house in the future on ice while they still live in the urban center. Um, and then when they're ready to make that move to the suburbs or wherever it is that that place is, um, they've got the house that they've bought at a lower price hopefully anyways, um, now. So that's one really creative way that people are still living in the city. But you, again, you have to have those savings in order to do mm -hmm. that. What if you want to stay in the city? If you want to stay in the city forever, yeah, you definitely want to make sure you don't buy a house that you're going to end up trying to, or a condo that you want to move in five years. Um, so if you want to, if you have savings and you want to stay in the city, you might just look at paying a lot of money in rent, um, if, especially if you want to have a family. So you would want to be looking at investing that money. So you want to make sure that you're using all of the tax credits to your ability, tax deductions in an RRSP, using a TFSA, and trying to get maybe income-producing investments so that you can offset some of the expensive rent that you might have to have. How much risk should they be prepared to take if they want to buy a home, say, five or ten years down the road? That's a great question. So it's all about your time horizon, right? So if somebody's going to rent forever and your time horizon is, is long, you can handle a lot more volatility. But if you want to buy a house in like five years, you want to pad your volatility, you maybe want to hold more fixed income products or maybe not as aggressive with your asset mix within those RRSPs and TFSAs because your time horizon is actually actually relatively short compared to someone who's saving for retirement. Gotcha. Scenario two. This person's got some money to invest, but not enough to afford real estate. So what should they do? Right. So if they're trying to build up towards buying real estate eventually, um, it would kind of be similar advice to scenario one is just keep your fixed costs really low. You know, don't have that inflated rent. Um, you know, try to make it work, whatever you're doing in low cost, you can save a lot of money. And if they are investing it in traditional methods, you could probably be a little bit more aggressive because your time horizon might not be five years. It's going to take you some time to get up to a down payment to afford a million dollar home one day. So a riskier approach could involve what? Uh, a riskier approach, uh, much more stocks, I would say. Um, a lot more like exposure to equity, less fixed income products. Um, and again, making use of those uh, RRSPs and TFSAs that you're avoiding and you're deferring taxes would be a really great method. That's pretty much always good advice anyway. Eh? If you can, put that money aside for a TFSA. Yeah, there is no magical product where you can like, you know, invest it here and it grows by 8% guaranteed that nobody knows about. I wish I knew about it. If I would invested it if there was. Scenario three. This person's got money to invest, but they move around a lot, and they can't commit to living in one place long term. Is it still worth their while to invest in real estate at all? So I think that buying real estate is not the only way to build wealth, and we are definitely in a culture where we think that, um, especially since the 2008 crash, you're seeing a lot of millennials where they've experienced so-so stock market returns um, or, or, you know, scarier or more volatile and amazing home, re like, real estate returns. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very scary not to own real estate, but you don't have to. However, I would say that if you can get creative, even if it's not your primary residence and you could be, a, you know, a landlord or buy an income property or something like that, if you're able able to um, from like a broad spectrum it might still be good to diversify between stock market risk and real estate risk because if you have if you only rent and you only do investment risk that's you, you're not diversified between the stock market risk and if you have a house that you can't really afford and you have no money to save in the stock market then you're all in the real estate market and interest rate risk is a thing for you hmm. so overall I think it's always a good thing to try and diversify between real estate and investments but if you can't do it just make sure if you can't buy real estate just make sure that you're saving a lot of money for retirement later on because you don't have that forced savings that you can then flip hmm. later on tax-free yeah, there's sort of two schools of thought here or two different theories on this one is that what goes up must come down hmm. and the other theory is Toronto 
<laughs> Toronto house prices only ever go in one direction. Which, which is more accurate? Okay, so uh, I have a theory about um, that I think that it'll continue to go up until we see the decentralization of the workforce. So um, more and more people are able to work from home. You only have to come into work physically one or two days a week. And at that point, you know, living in Guelph or living far away from the city centre where it's a two-hour commute would be something you'd never do on a daily basis. But if you only had to do it once or twice a week and you video conferenced other than that, hey, not so bad. Mm -hmm. So if we get that, then I think there might be less pressure on the Toronto um, real estate market and maybe we'll see a slowing. But this is where people want to live and uh, they're coming in droves and people from all over the GTA. So until that happens, I see it continuing to go up. Now, when you say Toronto, do you mean the 416 only or you I mean, mean the, the whole G GTA? I mean the whole GTA. I mean off the go train. Um, people will start to be able to live out there because they don't have to drive in every single day. It's astonishing. 125,000 people every year move into the greater Toronto that's area. That's what I'm saying. It's so astonishing. Un until that yeah. stops. <sighs> Can people do as well in the long term if they decide they do not want to invest in real estate? Yes. I firmly believe that um, with a really balanced asset mix over the long term and like a disciplined investment strategy, which just means not uh, freaking out when things go down and selling at a loss and then buying high because you're chasing returns. I believe that uh, with a discipline like that over a th 10 to 30 year, you can have just as high returns as the real estate market, especially if you're saving more because, hey, if the furnace breaks, it's not your problem. Right. Any other creative solutions that you've seen some of your younger clients out there chasing? Yeah, Airbnb. So, um, if you buy a house you can't afford, uh, this is something that sometimes I advise to do too. You go and hang out at mom and dad's in the suburbs for the weekend and then you Airbnb your place um, and that helps to offset some of the cost if you don't have enough money to create a basement rental apartment. That's a good point. How yeah. much could you make that way? Depends on where you are in the location, but like anywhere from like uh, 200 to 450 dollars a weekend, depending on like if you know TIFF is on or something like that in the city, mm -hmm. um, and then you get to go hang out and have mom's home cooking and make some money while you're at it. Do you ever give young people the advice that, you know what, for you, you just have to keep living in mom's basement? I have given that advice before. Yeah. yeah, it's typically with my younger demographic when they first graduate and they're not making a lot of money and they have student debt. Um, I'm definitely a fan of, hey, if, if you have the privilege of living at home and you don't hate your life and your parents don't hate you, um, <laughs> then you have a good thing going there. I mean, not everybody has that privilege, right? Yeah. So if you have that ability when you're young, you can get away with it a little bit longer than you know if you're 40 and moving back home with mom and dad. So take advantage of that. And oftentimes what I'll show them is like, if you stay at home even for you know a year longer, here's where you'll be and that alone is enough to motivate them to stick it out and just you know I always say I'm sorry to mom and dad like mm. sorry sorry but this represents 10 15 20 thousand of the kids Abs bottom line absolutely and uh, school continues to rise as a cost as well and mm -hmm. wages are stagnated and like work is precarious it's yeah. tough yeah. so when you're young stay at home if you can gotcha Shannon Lee Simmons financial planner founder of the new school of finance always good to have you here on TVO thanks so much thanks so much Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.